development and global health. That's what we want to talk about today. So um, as I think you all know, I'm Melissa Leach and I'm director here at IDS. Um, and I want to begin before we start um, with a thanks to the teams who are behind this launch today, um, which is a team from IDS, and you'll be hearing from some of our fellows later in the seminar. Um, it's our communications people, it's our facilities people, but critically, um, it's a big team over in the University of Sussex Library, many of whom are here. Um, and it's um, they've been working really hard over the last three years on what's been a really extraordinary project. So, as you may or may not know, until now, there's been a kind of treasure lurking in the basement just over there. Um, some of it's underneath this building here, underneath where you are, and it spills out into the beginning of the university library, and that's where you access it from. And until October 2019, um, people hadn't been in there for years. Earlier on, it had been it had, it had been developed. The, a whole set of documents had been collected by researchers and librarians from IDS and from all over the world, and they were sitting there in, frankly, a rather scary state. Um, I won't go into the details, but the condition was not good. Um, and more to the point, um, they weren't being accessed and used by the people who could make use of them. So we started and were lucky enough to get funding from the Wellcome Trust for a collaborative project to sort this collection, catalog it and publicize it to the world. And the beginning of the publicizing to the world is what is happening today with this launch. So a few facts and figures, as you say here, what we have in this collection is more than a quarter of a million documents, um, which together track the history of global development, the history of global health. Um, some more facts and figures. Um, there are now over 35,000 unique bibliographic um, search terms for these. It's been the largest ever cataloging project um, to secure funding from the Wellcome Trust, which is a big funder and they've supported many cataloging projects. And it now includes um, a huge range of kinds of documents. They range from global conference reports, policy reports, statistical runs, reports from national governments that are in fact over two kilometers of government reports. Just think of that, that's a lot of reports. Um, along with pamphlets from political parties, campaigning posters, educational posters, and much more. Um, and what these provide is an incredibly rich set of resources, a set of resources that at a time of global crises and global challenges that we're all facing in development and all trying to study and make sense of in our work and trying to do so in a way that is not colonial, that attempts to challenge power hierarchies, that brings more diverse voices to the table. We've got here some opportunities to do all of that. Why is that? What does this collection do? It tracks, in a way, the, the legacies, the histories, the genealogies, one might call it, through which some of the really powerful agendas in development emerged. Those that were to do with the early days of what we've called modernization, or the post-independence trajectories that those countries in Africa and Asia, which had been colonized, embarked on. These are documents that track what they were thinking about, what they were doing, some of the key moments at which these agendas emerged, but also how they were sometimes contested. So we also have documents that from civil society, from trades unions, from political groups that were challenging those dominant notions at the time. By looking at those, we can help it helps us to reflect on how these patterns, but also the disruptions to them in the history of development can actually help inform the challenges that we're dealing with right now. Perhaps bringing alternatives to those contemporary narratives of progress or showing up the power relations that were informing them that now more than ever need to be challenged. Above all, I think um, looking critically at the past can help us think 
critically and sensibly and constructively about the future and to have more historically informed debates about where everybody is going. So um, this seminar is going to um, share just some examples of how that might happen. Um, but to do so in relation to some particular themes. Now, the BLDS collection spans a lot of themes. Um, they range from, we've got them here, gender and sexuality, to energy and utilities, to labor and trades unions, to economy, to transport, to trade, to religion, to population, environment, and more. Um, and the, the way the cataloging has been organized is according to those different themes and according to countries. And there are more than 180 countries represented. So you can search in all those different ways. What we're going to do today in a moment is hear um, some highlights and some stories one might begin to bring out from some of the highlights relating into in particular to, to sort of three of those themes. So in a moment, I'm going to hand over to Erica Nelson, who's going to um, share some insights about population and family planning, um, speaking to those themes. Then I'll turn to Jeremy Alouche, who's another of our um, fellows here, who's going to talk to us about climate and environment, picking up particularly on that environmental theme and some of the key documents there. And then to Hayley McGregor, um, who is going to pick up on some other aspects of the health theme. This is a collection that's very rich in resources around health, but not only health. Um, there's an enormous amount here that can help us think critically about where we are and where we might be going. So without further ado, let me hand over to Erica. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. So, or should I be? It doesn't matter. Yeah. Yeah. I will come over here. No, that's fine. Oh, where's the clicker? Awesome. I'll use that. Um, okay. Well, I have 10 minutes to give you a brief overview of um, the relevance of the family planning and population survey materials in the BLDS Legacy Collection. And what I wanted to do was just sort of ex give one small slice to understand both, both where IDS sits in relationship to the story of development more broadly, because what the collection tells us, what it will tell us as research is done on it in the future, is the development of both of ideas, of approaches, of programs, of policies, of um, dominant narratives in the field of development over time. And it also tells us about where IDS was at certain points in its own trajectory. So um, my own historical interest has been, um, it's a lot of things, but I've looked a lot at sexual and reproductive health, the emergence of sort of rights focused debates around women's bodies, around sort of reproductive autonomy, but a much earlier development history that's coming back today very strongly as it relates to decolonizing debates about the role of uh, coercive family planning, uh, population control debates, and sort of ideologies that linked economic progress and modernization in the quote unquote third world to family planning in sort of this crucial moment in development history, which is the 1960s. So IDS, for those of you who don't know, was founded in 1966. So these materials aren't from our collection. I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a little bit of context to understand some of the materials we do have in our collection, but it's just to explain that when IDS came into being, these were very very dominant debates at the time. It wasn't something that IDS itself specifically worked on, but the fact that it houses so many materials related to family planning, population surveys, the role of demography and development shows that these were debates that were very live and active at in this in this window of time. So. What critical historical perspectives offer is new insights into both present action and imagining or reimagining of what is possible for the future, but also this, this sort of a, a, a new lens onto um, a, a critical lens onto understanding the past and how it maybe continues to inform the present today. These This set of images relate to the fact that, again, I'm planting the seed that the birth of sort of the development decade, you know, the launch of the development decade by, um, by, by USA, by the Alliance for Progress, um, coincided with a point in time when family planning was seen as one central feature in modernization and development of um, 
again, in big air quotes, third world countries. So it was it was something that there was a lot of money and resources poured into it, a lot of attempts to understand the problem of overpopulation in certain countries. This time magazine cover from 1960 relates to um, it was like, you know, this this idea that there was a population bomb that was exploding that was going to have major impacts on food, on agriculture, and on the economic prospects of a number of countries. But equally, there was a lot of pushback at this point in time, including aid-funded programs, philanthropic foundation programs that were kicked out of countries because of, um, you know, accusations that what they were really doing was running coerced family planning programs. So like I say, this was, there's a, there's a reason why, and I'll come to it, the ideas collection contains so many materials on family planning. Um, and one of the, you know, historically, sometimes we are challenged in today's moment to recognize very problematic aspects of past development. And I would also call upon practitioners in development today to not always tend towards that instinct to disconnect ourselves from the past, to sort of see things that were problematic in the past and say, well, we've left that behind in the past. Because sometimes what you find is that there's continuities in thought and action. And I'll come to this later, but you know, currently we have foundations in the US as well as here um, that are revisiting their own eugenics legacies that are that are actually revisiting the work and the money and the resources they poured into these family planning programs and asking themselves in this moment, do they need to reckon with uh, their own problematic past action? Actions that includes Ford Foundation um, is active in this space. Rockefeller is active in this space, um, and the reason why is that. And this is just like a whistle stop tour. But in effect, in the lead up to this, um, you know, let's call it the birth of modern development action, um, development as practice, as study, as initiative, uh, in the 1960s came at a point in time when this, again, this argument had been building for decades that linked both ideas of scarcity of food and land with overpopulation, that's sort of this neo-Malthusianism, but then also eugenics theory, which people tend to think of as existing, you know, purely um, with the Nazis and, and, you know, with the Holocaust, and they think that it kind of ended there. But in fact, eugenics took a great number of forms. There weren't just one, one way of thinking about sort of um, limiting fertility. This idea that certain women, certain mothers, certain classes of population were problematic um, and that their fertility needed to be controlled or reduced was a very sort of popular form of thought that at the launch of the development de decade, it was undergirding a lot of initial action. So food aid programs, rural village development programs were often linked to or had a family planning component built within them um, because this is such a, a core argument at the time. And uh, J. Myon Stikos, the quote I included earlier, a common thing you'll read in these documents is that it was seen as, in economic terms, a, a bargain. This would be, you know, you invest a small amount of family planning and you would get massive um, uh, benefits economically from that investment. So this was sort of um, guiding philosophy at the time. So what do we find in the BLDS legacy collection? So I'm going to go through a series of images that give you a sense of what kinds of materials we hold here. Um, you get a lot of this sort of the birth of uh, new forms of demography, uh, the absolute centrality of enumerating, counting, um, having documentation of the, the contraceptive practices of women, um, the uh, use of whether it was modern or traditional methods, fertility, how many women, uh, how many sort of children people were having. And you get a very strong articulation about this idea of the nuclear family, two children, um, two parents, two children as being sort of an ideal that everybody everywhere should be aiming for. So there's a lot of material that is about this national censuses, um, again, sort of profiles of contraceptive use. And, and we have like an overwhelming amount of material that is sort of national level family planning programs, though often with funding um, and attachment to sort of uh, external um, investment. And we have a lot of materials that sort of reflect this visual language of the planned family as being a modern family. So you will see this, just a few examples, but you'll see this trope repeated in the BLDS legacy collection materials of some sort of an image of what the sort of ideal modern family should be that one can only achieve through sort of modern contraceptive message and you know fertility um, limitations. So this is a strong message that's coming through 
this is these now go into the 80s, but sort of in the 60s, 70s, and the 80s, you have just an absolute um, overabundance of, of materials that sort of focus on these issues. So what stories can we tell with the material that this collection houses? Um, we're at a bit on our back foot as researchers here because this uh, the cataloging process means that we haven't actually been doing research in this collection. Um, but what we have now is an, an incredible opportunity to invite people in to start to work with these materials and make sense of them. And so that includes both histories I'm referring to, which are already written, right? That kind of give this top down view of international development and the, the positioning of, of family planning and population debates within that. But the IDS collection means that people can tell more nationally specific stories. They can look at counter narratives and counter movements. They can look at resistances. That is what can emerge when one engages with this collection. So, um, you know, yes, we have a tremendous amount of demographic material, population survey material and family planning um, advocacy material, but also within the collection, and I don't have images to show it, but we will also have indications of the rise in Southern-based feminist movements, the pushback against these approaches to family planning, fertility control, women not just as productive drivers or reproductive drivers of development, but as productive. So these arguments about gender development, women in development, that IDS itself was very connected to networks of dissenting ideas. So this is what is in store for those who engage with the material. And now I'll turn to Jeremy. Thanks. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me well? Yeah. Brilliant. We, we can hear you. Fantastic. Um, um, so I'm going to focus on um, uh, more on sort of, uh, aspects linked uh, in the library that are relevant to sort of political ecology debates. Um, what I've decided to do today is to focus on a very sort of niche topic and a very specialized. It's not providing an overview of what's there in terms of political ecology, environmental change and climate change at the uh, BLDS, but it's much more about um, linking to a particular new project of mine and how I could potentially in some ways use uh, the BL BLDS uh, legacy collection uh, for, for for my project. So if we move to the next slide. Uh, so I'm going to focus essentially on the idea of desertification, and especially in 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 the Sahel, so in uh, in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and uh, I'm going to explain why the collection can provide some really interesting insights. Um, but just some historical background first. I think it's quite important to go back to the colonial roots of the concept and the way that desertification was fought uh, under colonial time. Uh, the term has been coined, uh, although it's probably disputed, but in the 1920s by a French colonial forester. Um, and what's quite interesting is that you can see that there's been many different programs by Western powers to try and curtail the perceived spread, if you like, of deserts and to restore the sort of dry land of productivity. And I think underlying these, if you like, was attempts um, of sort of complex and long-standing European colonial understanding of deserts, which equated them basically with ruined re ruined forest uh, much of the time. So this idea, if you like, that um, is essentially deserts were sort of wasted opportunity. Um, and what's important also is that the sort of causes of these desertification, um, which came back as a key debate in the 70s, um, you got the 1997 United Na uh, Nations Conference on Desertification, which remains one of the sort of pillar in terms of, uh, of thinking uh, around uh, desertification. Um, obviously, in the Sahel, there was a number of uh, severe droughts, uh, most notably in the 72 and 74. And what happened is that during this period, there was a sort of persistent narrative that um, the causes of the de de desertification were very much linked to ind indigenous land use. Um, many academic studies have attempted to, to, to challenge this sort of persistent narrative in terms, both in terms of scale and in terms of speed. Um, I can't go into too much detail about that. Uh, but what's important is that in some ways, some of these uh, narrative actually are now 
being completely scientifically challenged in the sense that most of these droughts do not originate from the land and indigenous land use, but much more from the oceans. Um, um, essentially, the warming of the tropical ocean um, uh, and especially the difference between different temperature between the Indian Ocean and the sort of Atlantic Ocean creates uh, some of these uh, phenomena in, in the Sahel. But let's turn back um, in some ways to, to, to the collection. We can go to the next slide. And I decided to, to focus on two very specialized body. The first one is the uh, Permanent uh, Interstate Committee for Drought Control in the Sahel which basically his mission is to invest in research for food security and to fight against the effect of drought and desertification uh, for a new, eco new ecological balance in the Sahel. That's the sort of proper uh, uh, mission of uh, the CRSS. And then part of the CRSS is the Institut du Sahel, uh, which is a specialized institution which is um, uh, whose mandate is there to sort of coordinate, harmonize, and promote uh, scientific and technical research in the countries. So we can move to the next slide. So here's just a couple of uh, photographs of some of the documents that are available in, in the uh, BRDS collection. As I said, it's a, it's a very sort of specialized niche, to niche topic, but there were some really interesting documents um, that actually bounds very nicely with Erica's presentation in terms of uh, neo maltesian uh, uh, ideas in thinking about uh, 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 nature and, and, and population, and of um, and also in terms of sort of scarcity with respect to, to land and, and, and to water. Uh, so there's a couple of documents, as you can see, some are sort of very specialized. So uh, uh, some some focus on, on very specific countries and so on. Um, uh, we can move to the next slide. There's one that I picked up, which was um, actually. Um, a, a document um, which is um, uh, the elocution by the uh, former president of Mali, the Col Colonel Moussa Traoré, during a meeting in 1974 at the CIRS um, uh, um, um, annual groups. And uh, the quote is in French, but basically, uh, which, which basically says that um, while, while we are still thinking of, of trying to understand uh, the causes of these phenomena, and uh, uh, about re with respect to desertification, its character still remains very obscure. Uh, there is, there seems to be a secret, cyclical uh, character to it, um, uh, but we still, we still need to understand it mostly from a scientific perspective. And I highlighted that because I thought it was really interesting that in '74, uh, uh, sort of president of Mali at the time in some ways could, could be questioning some of these narrative of sort of indigenous land use and starting to introduce much more uncertainty about the, the sort of root causes uh, about these droughts and, and desertification. So that's just one example, which is quite interesting in terms of countering mainstream narratives, that mainstream development narrative that were emerging at the time. And there you can see a, a, a sort of, uh, a, a, a sort of counter voice, if you like, emerging about with respect to these narrative. Uh, next slide. So, what does it? What? Why is that useful? It, so, it's useful for for, for for many ways. I've highlighted here three points. Um, the first one is that it provides these documents provide a sort of fundamental and historical baseline to understand the persistence of these sort of neo melotilsian ideas and ecological myths, myths, sorry, or uh, in some ways, as I pointed out in, in the extract before, the ways that these could be challenged. Um, secondly, I think they are very important also because in some ways the, the, the material at the library uh, is uh, full of a uh, uh, sort of regional, international organization, scientific bodies, and so on. And um, I think that some of the debates essentially focus on big development narrative, on donors, and uh, and so on. But the role of sort of regional uh, organization uh, tend to be um, tend to be in some ways sidelined in the debate. So in some ways, revisiting that enables us to understand the role of these regional organization around the reproduction of these narratives and the proposed solution in this area. 
And then finally, how, why is that so important and fundamental? Sorry, I'm moving away my computer. <laughs> the third point is essentially that some of these debates right now, so such as the uh, Great Green War Initiative, which is a, basically um, a, 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 an enormous attempt uh, to fight desertification across the Sahel. Um, um, and it is really impossible to try and understand these big initiatives and the way that they've been relaunched without going back and understanding how these narratives are being sort of replicated and reproduced. So I think there's a lot of value in some ways in actually most of our projects at IDS to go and revisit um, some of um, the, the, the precious documents that are there at the, uh, the BLDS um, uh, collection to go and revisit some of the sort of origins of the narrative and to use some of this material. Thank you very much. Over to you, Haley. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Wonderful. So um, I'm going to focus in on a snapshot of what the legacy collection reveals regarding the big um, agendas related to improving public health in the newly independent African states. And the BLDS legacy collection really has some fascinating materials that point to the efforts of new ministries of health to improve the health of national populations in the 1960s and 70s. And this snapshot really revealed to me the integral connection between the discourses around improving public health, but also development and narratives of progress that were so prominent at that time. And this was really the heyday of the big institutions such as of international health and the WHO, of course, having been established in the immediate post-war period in 1948. If I could have the first slide, please. So in the legacy collection, we find some government documents that highlight one of the primary preoccupations of the first decades of the World Health Organization, namely controlling infectious disease. And I'm going to focus in on this because I think there's a lot to reflect on and learn, particularly since this is a big area of contemporary research again um, at um, IDS, particularly in the, the moment we're in at the moment, having just emerged from the first big um, pandemic of the 21st century. Um, so at, at the time um, in those the, the 1960s and 70s, there was really a sort of strong thrust towards improving health through sort of triple strategies of improving conditions of life, building healthcare systems and institutions, and then also educating a population about the, the medical science of preventing infection through technologies such as vaccination and, and antibiotics. So if you look at the slide there, you see a booklet from the Ministry of Health of Ghana put out in 1971, which provides steps to, as you can see, I quote, keep cholera out of your town and village. And if you look inside that document, there's the emphasis is really on improved water, sanitation, food hygiene, all of these signs of so-called progress towards better standards of living um, and health. And then if you look at that document in the middle on the slide from the same ministry, this was prepared for a trade fair in Ghana in 1967. And there's a preface from the Director of Health Services stating that, and again, I quote, the aim is to assure investors, both foreign and local, that provision exists in Ghana for the protection and promotion of the people's health as developing Africa is the theme of the Ghana International Trade Fair, it's hoped that this brochure will assure the visitor to Ghana that the health and medical services available in the country are receiving attention in the country's development progress. So you see the strong interconnection between progressing health and promoting a narrative of, of development. 
and the institutional and workforce infrastructures to ensure curative and preventative services included a health education division in the Ministry of Health in Ghana, which put out a Health in Ghana series. And, and one of these is, is held in the Legacy Collection and was in fact published to commemorate what was then the 29th anniversary of the founding of the WHO. And as you can see, it chose the theme, immunize and save your child's life. So this exhortation to healthcare workers to promote vaccination. And this push was very much in keeping with big movements at the time to promote um, comprehensive, progressive primary healthcare in association with famous declaration in 1978 called the Alma Arta um, dec declaration that was made in a, in a town in the then um, Soviet um, Union. And so it's really fascinating because um, in, in this pamphlet on vaccination is, is also the detail of the childhood vaccination regimen for Ghana at the time. And, and it includes a really prominent place for smallpox vaccination. And smallpox was the first disease in 1980 ever to be declared eradicated. And this was really hailed as a success of vaccination. So these documents in the collection provide an impression of a certain optimism linked to this period, which is, is fascinating for me, who as someone who works in, in um, health, because Alma Arta famously aspired to providing health for all by 2000. And even at the time in 1978, that was seen as, as overly aspirational. But in that moment, you, know, you saw the production of antibiotic drugs proliferating. This was sort of before the really big concerns about antimicrobial resistance and there was the sense that disease could be vanquished and that technologies and, and medical science would prevail and place populations on this kind of ine inevitable trajectory to improved health. But of course, if we pause at, at in the 21st century and we look back at the late 1970s from our vantage point, now our sort of current health concerns in this post-COVID period, we know, of course, that this optimism was, was um, premature and um, possibly naive. The arrival of global pandemics would, of course, see a shift from a paradigm of, of health that we're seeing in these documents that was very much about addressing health within national borders and, and um, across the 90s, 1980s into the 1990s, we see a really marked shift to a paradigm of, of global health, what's now seen as an era where, where um, epidemics, for example, that move across national boundaries and are increasingly interconnected world, a time that really started requiring institutions beyond those of the nation state. So by the 1980s, new concerns emerged um, about a, a strange new human immune deficiency virus that seemed to be spreading across the globe that progressed rapidly to what came to be called the acquired immune deficiency syndrome or AIDS. And this, of course, became the big, the big pandemic of the late um, 20th century. And, and if we sort of think back now to, to that time in, in the 1980s, we're, we're aware of, of really interesting points that kind of are so relevant for our moment now. Because of course, if we just think of, of one example, in, in May of this year, the WHO has declared another public health emergency of international concern, namely the zoonotic disease called monkeypox. And it's rather ironic that the cessation of smallpox vaccination um, and the waning protection is in fact now thought to be contributing to the upsurge of, of monkeypox in, in West Africa and indeed the, the current multi-country outbreak. If I could have the next slide, please. So um, I'm going to just um, focus finally on the early 1990s and the HIV pandemic because the legacy collection holds really important documents, I think, from the harsh early days of, of HIV AIDS on the African continent, particularly in, in 
um, Sub-Saharan Africa, and this is in a period when before antiretroviral therapy was available, the, the drugs that suppress the, the virus. And I, I've had a closer look at this material, partly because I lived through this time when I was training as a doctor in South Africa. And this particular part of the legacy collection really takes me back powerfully to that time. And it was really captured by um, the writer and photographer Gideon Mandel in the 1990s, and this was really a time when in, sub, in Southern Africa, HIV was, was creating enormous fear. It was a, a terminal disease. If I could have the next slide. So just to give you a snapshot of the kinds of documents in the legacy collection from this period, it was a, a period in the 1990s in, in um, Southern Africa that really um, sort of spawned a language that inextricably linked um, health and, and development because HIV AIDS came to be seen as a, as a sort of development crisis and fears were rife in Southern Africa of sort of wide social dislocation. And we saw um, terms becoming very common, such as orphans and vulnerable children, a real concern to, to develop approaches to impact mitigation. We saw a real resurgence of community-based organizations to respond to this, um, this disease, return to community health workers, something that was really prominent around the time of Alma Arte in the late 1970s. So to give you a flavor of the kinds of materials I've found, so there's a sentinel surveillance report from the mid-1990s from what was then the Kingdom of Swaziland, now Eswatini, a country very heavily hit by HIV at this time. There's a 1996 government plan for home-based care for the terminally ill in, in Botswana. There's a social welfare report assessing orphan support in Malawi. And in fact, something that was really poignant for me, a 1990 manual for healthcare workers in Zimbabwe providing guidance for AIDS counseling, bearing in mind that at, at this time, this was a terminal disease. And um, of course, HIV was also inextricably linked to, to um, rights-based movements. It really gave a huge push to the idea of health as a right and access to, to healthcare and drugs as a right. And, and this was the period in the 1990s that saw the rise of new institutional architectures of global health, global health initiatives and, and pressures to provide universal access to new antiretroviral drugs. If I could have the last slide, please. And we saw in the late 1990s, an increasing discourse of AIDS as a threat to global security and a sort of unprecedented meeting of the United Nations General Assembly, a special session on HIV, which led to a declaration of commitment on HIV AIDS in 2001. We saw HIV um, featuring prominently in the Millennium, Millennium Development Goals and the documents in the legacy collection in the 2000s mark the sh shifting landscape of global response. So for example, there's a 2008 progress report from the national response from Botswana to, to looking at progress towards meeting the commitments of that UN General Assembly special session. And there's also a booklet put out in 2006 by the African Civil Society Coalition on HIV AIDS, which points to the activism that drove the wider rights-based advocacy for treatment and services on the continent, which gradually turned HIV into a chronic disease and returned some hope to stem transmission through a focus on drugs and, and treatment um, as prevention. So to conclude, um, in this current moment of, of widespread reflection on, on COVID-19 and the devastating health, socioeconomic and political implications of this first big pandemic of the 21st century, these documents in the legacy collection really throw up many themes which are occurring now in recent debates about infectious disease responses and pandemic preparedness. And, and it's really relevant to us because it's, there's, of course we have a big program of work at IDS on pandemic preparedness. And the documents really point for me to the value of historically informed debate as we face these new challenges, although I was reflecting that my small foray into the legacy collection also makes me question if, if lessons have really been learned. And I, I reflect, for instance, on the parallels between um, 
inequities in COVID vaccine supply and the slow arrival of therapy for HIV in Africa. And there are also echoes um, in these documents of the assumptions um, surrounding health communication in the 1970s and the parallels now with some of the assumptions in vaccination campaigns and some of the strategies that have been adopted for combating so-called vaccine hesitancy for, for COVID-19. I sort of see similar um, difficulties arising. And as such, these documents are really a prescient reminder of the need for a real shift in thinking and power in global health. Thank you. Thank you so much, colleagues. So what we see here is just three examples of what can happen when you go hunting, treasure hunting in the BLDS legacy collection. Um, three areas of really contemporary debate, um, women's rights over their bodies and population, climate and environmental change, pandemics um, and, and public health. And examples which show us what happens in the relationship between big global initiatives and debates and the ways that national contexts and even local ones pick them up and take them on. Some of the continuities that emerge through histories and narratives up to the present, but also some of the changes in those. And clearly some, as Haley I think put it very well, not exactly lessons from history, but kind of, kind of clues as to continuities and ruptures that we really need to think about before as we come to evaluate where we are now and where we might go in the future. So thank you very much to, to the three of you. Um, we're now going to open up for, for questions and comments. Um, we've got the whole of our team here. So if you have anything super technical, like how do I access this collection? I'm going to, going to turn to colleagues there. But I'd actually like to ask for a, a first set of comments if any of our um, advisory board members would like to say anything, because we've had, a, we've had a fabulous group of wider advisors from the University of Sussex and from other collections in other parts of the UK who've been helping us as we've gone through this process. So um, if anybody from that group wants to speak first, please do. Uh, hello, I'm, I'm Nick Wyatt, Keeper of Library and Archives at the Science Museum in London, and I've been on the advisory board from since the middle of the pandemic, which is not the best time to join a, an advisory board. So today is the first time I'm actually going to see the collection in, in person, as it were. I just want to congratulate the, the project team, uh, everyone involved and the University of Sussex on what has been quite a remarkable uh, outcome for, what, for, for, for this project, which I know has been um, challenging uh, as it was taking place during the pandemic. So well done, uh, it's a great outcome and I look forward to hearing about successes in the future about how the collection can be used, not just here in Sussex, but also perhaps collaboratively with other organizations such as the Science Museum, which we discussed this morning because we have our own GM archives that actually complement this collection. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's great. I don't know if John or Vinita want to say anything. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I, I want to reiterate that uh, as a historian um, who is at the University of Sussex as a South Asian historian, this is a fantastic collection. The fact that it's housed here is the effort of developmental practitioners and librarians at IDS. And it's absolutely right that a world leading institution should have such a rich collection. And for you as students here uh, and the researchers to be able to use this collection is absolutely amazing and wonderful and that, that you're able to use it. And I just want to underline the fact that this is the one collection in the world that is about the post-colonial contemporary history of the global South. And it houses a very, very rich source for understanding the post-colonial history of uh, India, Africa, Latin America. So in that sense, this is a unique collection. I also want to underline the fact that this collection is not available back 
in many of these countries. So exa for example, I research on scheduled castes and scheduled tribes, and they are very rich official and non-official documents relating to these communities in this collection. So I would ideally like this collection also to be digitally repatriated and many of you to take that initiative uh, forward in terms of digital repatriation and to decolonize these collections in the way in which they are meant to be. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm also a member of the advisory board and I'm external to the um, University of Sussex. Um, I, I've been a historian and I've also used the collection immediately prior to this project and already could find so many incredible nuggets connecting the stories, the stories of that are current stories that are current with uh, processes of long standing in the post colonial world. And I want to um, both reiterate Nick's thanks, but also uh, Vanita's um, uh, comments about some of the potential within that material to um, advance and feed into debates that are currently. Uh, coursing through the academy and the world more broadly around decolonization, because within these uh, materials, there are so many um, hints and signals of uh, attempts to repatriate power from the center to the to the go the national governments um, and and some of the contestations that have had that has have followed development projects throughout their history so that the the so that decolonization itself as we understand it now in itself has a prehistory which courses through uh, this archive and you can go to this archive and find find out so much about the the, the politics of who controls what how resources are allocated who's in charge and why and and why some previous efforts have foundered, have not come to fruition. Um, and, and in that way, this legacy is a legacy not just of the development process, but of its counter stories and counter narratives. John, fantastic. And before we open up, I just want to add, um, you could ask why in our era of decolonization, we choose to hold a collection like this here in Sussex, rather than repatriating every document to the country or locality from whence it came. I think one answer to, and we've asked ourselves that same question, one answer is that there's a value in a coherence in having a collection all together in one place. Secondly, that by having it together, we're able to, to catalog it and make it searchable and make it available. Whereas if every document had been sent back to its original location, if that were possible, um, they would get fragmented and lost. But the third is that we really want to do it. So this resourcing from the Wellcome Trust has enabled the cataloging. We've had a couple of spin-off digitizing projects which have enabled little bits of the collection to go fully online. But the plan now for the next stage is both to make it possible for um, people to perhaps request a document if they're not able to visit, visit Sussex and have access to it on a limited basis, and also to seek further funding for projects which will enable us to work with some of the libraries in the Global South in the way that IDS used to do um, a, a couple of decades ago when we had big funding from what was then DFID to enable us to work with libraries and do document exchange. We now want to see what we can do now into the future to make more available digitally and to work with countries to create that mutual access as our debates on decolonizing development and history really um, make it incumbent on us to do. But in the meantime, those of you who are here this year, and I'm speaking now particularly to our students, have a unique opportunity because it's right there and you can go and access it and use it in situ. So um, let me now open up to anybody who would like to ask questions, make further comments. Um, and we can go on until 2.30, though if anyone has to leave at 2 for a class or another meeting, um, please feel free just to slip out.
Hello. <clears throat> Sorry. Hello. Can you hear me? Um, hi, I'm Alice. I work for the library, but not on this project, but I'm also doing a research project about um, how we can understand the history of the library and its collections through a decolonial lens. So my question relates back to the ones that were just raised about the sort of decolonial uh, legacies embedded within the colonial legacies rather embedded in in the collection. And my question, I don't know who to direct it to, um, really, because it's maybe partly a question for library colleagues, but also for um, people who are more experienced at the IDS, is, is more about the sort of provenance of the collection itself, its origins, and, and, and how, how the items were acquired and used over the last half century. Because obviously it's not a new collection, and it has been used, and it was collected yeah. for research and development and policy, et cetera. Yeah. So I'm just wondering um, if with, with steps to perhaps gain further funding for, for um, projects like digital repatriation, et cetera, what can be done to learn about that provenance and to describe why it is here and, and, and who used it and, and what that story is and how that might be relevant to people in the global south now? Sorry, yeah. that was quite a lot in one question. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you see what I'm getting at? Um, about the history of the collection itself. Absolutely. Um, Erica, do you want to respond to that one? You've thought about this a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, so we don't yet have the answer to your question because it, in the way that it was originally formed, it was a working library of materials that we know you know, from having reviewed it and having lived through this project, those of us who are on the academic research staff, that it does map on to trends in development or large initiatives that IDS was part of or certain thinkers that were that were net part of the sort of international networks that were active at, at given moments in time. So, I mean, just an example is like, I remember finding at one point sort of a run of development economics literature from Venezuela. That's not a place we have a lot of act activity in now, but in the 60s and 70s, it was a major center of economic development thought. We had Latin American development economists working here at the time. So it kind of made sense. It's like, oh, okay, so that's why this ended up living here. So these are stories that are as yet to be uncovered in the sense that like different thematic areas and different chronological periods will map onto processes and development that each kind of merit um, deeper investigation in their own right. So I think that your question is like, that's that's a great like research uh, project that somebody should undertake to better understand these, these intellectual trajectories, but also how that, because the material wasn't, I guess the, the quickest answer to your question is it wasn't kept or saved or didn't land here in some kind of systematic way. It, it, it just mm. grew over time according to sort of whatever were sort of the leading research agendas. I mean, frankly, probably Richard, you should, yeah. you should weigh in on the answer to this question, but that's yeah. my understanding yeah. of how, it, how the material came to live here. Yeah. I think oh, so this might work in, yeah, I, I think that's exactly right. I mean, it was basically assembled through a combination of the materials that IDS researchers brought back on their trips and their forays around the world, so reflected where they went and the grey literature and the documents they picked up on their travels and then brought back and deposited here. And then um, the strenuous efforts and connections of the library staff at the time when this was a working library and this room here was a working working library um, and then the networks they had with librarians in in many other countries across the world who would send them documents in exchange sometimes from documents from from here so it accreted in quite an incremental way and I think you're right there's an intellectual history of IDS that can be told partly through this collection. I'm wondering if Richard Jolly, who of course has written intellectual histories of IDS as well as histories of the UN and has lived through much of this process, wants to wants to say anything at this point. I mean, Richard, do you if you've got any words about what the BLDS collection has 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 meant to you or what you might remember about how it came to be? I don't. I don't think, <clears throat> excuse me, I don't, I don't think I've got uh, very much to add. It is of enormous importance that I can underline. Um, 
I see it also from the UN point of yeah. view and the uh, the 1960s were very much the uh, beginning of as, as was brought out by by someone uh, of the development decade and Hans Singer who was a distinguished fellow of IDS when he was here he used mm -hmm. to point to the uh, development decade which if I'm remembering rightly set the goal of uh, developing countries growing by I think six percent by the end of the 1960s yeah and um, the interesting thing is at the time the goal was set it was dismissed as totally unrealistic in fact the developing countries achieved I think seven percent growth in the 1960s so this history is very uh, important to mm -hmm. bring out and I, I hope therefore people will be using the documents. Yeah, yeah. that's a great, Thank great you. point. Just one more thing to add to the, to the question that was asked, because I think it is actually relevant to, sorry, I just wanted to come back on one more point, which is that I think that what will also be uncovered when people engage with the material is that we tend to sort of think, and even historically often write, um, either top down or bottom up and kind of pay less attention to the circularities and the networks through which sort of ideas and mm -hmm. projects flow. And so it isn't quite such a simple story as, oh, somebody from here went to Ghana, brought back a document, now it lives here. IDS has always had, this isn't to dismiss sort of the, the, the post-colonial moment as still being highly colonial, but also to say that that the collection might also be an opportunity, and, and Jeremy and Haley both alluded to it, and I did less of a good job of alluding to it, but that there's a lot of counter narratives, but that were also networked counter narratives. So mm -hmm. people that were talking to each other across geographic spaces and divides and sharing ideas that did not reflect necessarily dominant discourse, whether it's at UN level or elsewhere, but also within the UN, there are people who have a multitude of ideas about any of the agenda. So yeah. all of that richness will sort of be, I think is, is um, fodder for historical research to, to examine more closely. But I think it also runs counter a little bit to sort of simplistic narratives about sort of what it means to decolonize development today. So yeah. sorry, just Brilliant. had to add that. Thanks. I know I, you have your own mic. I've, I've got my own mic if that's working. <laughs> So, um, others, I mean, ask questions as, as questions, comments, thoughts. Are there any of you here who've used this collection or have used historical materials elsewhere and, and have got reflections on how they can be helpful to, to the current challenges of understanding the world? Or ways in which you think you might do? Hi, yeah. Hi, I'm Joe from the IDS Monitoring, Evaluation and Learning Team. So I'm sort of interested in the lessons. All of you, your, all three presentations talked about like the continuity, um, the change in the continuity in the narratives. Jeremy mentioned it for the climate kind of stuff. You mentioned it for the, um, the health side of it. I wondered if you've like, if this may be a research project in its own right, but... <coughs> From having gone through the archive, are there any like key lessons that you've drawn out around existing narratives around health security and contestation in those areas of contestation in climate change narratives? So I feel like I'm not being very clear, but what what can be learned from the archive in terms of how things are currently being framed? And mm. let's if I go back to health security, there's a sort of um issue within that around that contravening certain individual rights and is there are mm. there any lessons around that in the archive or what are the main lessons you thought were coming out of it i, do, I mean i want to give a journey yeah as well, but i could yeah. pick it off in a journey them or um yes why don't you pick that up and if Haley and jeremy can still be with us well I, i'm going to give yeah. the historian's answer which is that there aren't lessons to be extracted we tend to like to use um history as a jumping off point to be 
to have critical reflections on the present rather than, you know, simply because the context will have changed so much. And it is, it is true that in contemporary development debates, and certainly global health debates, people often turn to history for a lesson. So in the pandemic, we saw a lot of that, that people were sort of turning to past pandemics saying, let me extract from this, there's a lesson for the contemporary mo moment. But sometimes what's missed in that is actually what, what history is telling you. It, 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 to me, what it tells us is it counters the hubris of what we think we can achieve in the current moment or what we think, you know, so it can show you that change over time isn't linear for starters and that your role within it is quite unpredictable or the role of any given sort of set of activities is, is unpredictable. So it kind of, I think, puts a, a great amount of perspective on what this contemporary action today means, what its place is. Um, I, I think that humility is a very important um, uh, quality in both development and health that we should encourage more of. So I think it gives that, but it also gives you a vantage point from which to see more clearly some of the biases of the present. So it's less of a lesson and more of a vantage point that I think it offers, yeah. but Haley and Jeremy yeah. might disagree. Yeah. Haley or Jeremy, um, if you're sort of managing to pick up on this discussion, do you want to come in on it? Yes, indeed. I can, I can comment. I think Erica just made a, a really good comment and I, I, I would absolutely agree. I think, um, what I take away from it, as I sort of hinted in my presentation, really, is that there are these sort of complex dynamics and, and interactions that, that um, sort of affect health status, um, the emergence of health problems, and, and that, um, you know, that they're also really entrenched power relations. And so actually, it's, it's really difficult to just sort of shift things and and as I I said you know if I look back at that sort of moment of of Alma Arta and the sort of optimism of health for all by the year 2000 and in fact if we think of 2000 through the prism of my HIV example that was precisely when um, antiretrovirals were not available on the African continent that really needed them desperately so um it was a moment really when universal access to drugs in that instance was was still sort of you know extremely important and and nobody could have predicted um necessarily hiv and what what emerged but then of course there were positive elements i didn't hear the question very well but i did hear you know, what about sort of rights and rights-based movements and and that i would see you know looking back at the legacy collection that that really brought to mind again that enormous sort of leap forward and with HIV around sort of redefining um, health also um, as a right um, and and the kind of activism that went with that. I mean, the, the interesting one to reflect on now, as I also said, is that, you know, there's so much talk about learning from pandemics, but I think most of the historians say that, that very few lessons um, have been learned. And of course, the this the unfolding of, of enormous inequity and in access to vaccines for COVID-19 and the sort of vaccine hoarding that we saw sort of just sort of again illustrated that wider problem of, of global inequalities and the sort of issues around how the health status in, in certain countries made people more vulnerable to um, COVID-19. So, um, and also the fact that priorities are often different in different countries. And with COVID-19, we also saw, you know, sort of um, global health institutions and sort of, um, pushing a particular set of priorities in response and, and not much dialogue and attention to how, to different circumstances in different countries and how the pandemic was playing out. So I guess to, to answer this question about lessons learned, I think Erica's absolutely right. Um, change is not linear, those narratives of sort of inevitable progress just, um, you know, really seem naive to me. These these issues are, are complex. And I think this in this moment, hopefully, at the very least, there's a sense of really needing to look more closely at these um, power relations and, and what those yeah. mean for, for redistribution of health resources. 
Great. Um, Jeremy, what, what are your reflections here? I mean, what the things you were looking at relate to some of the, the very biggest challenges of our time. Everybody's looking for lessons as to how to how to deal with environmental change. But I guess you're not finding key lessons there. No, I think it's it's very similar to what uh, Haley was saying. But what, what I like to insist is is about the, the sort of added value and the originality about the collection. And I think what is important is, you know, if you look at the historiography of it, that we is still to be written in some ways. Um, but most there's a lot of documents which are very sort of technical documents, um, United Nations agencies documents, or uh, we we got other sort of scientific research bodies documents and so on that I think were bought as a, at a time where they were analysed very much from a wasn't going to say a political point of view, but very much as building facts and evidence. Um, but I think that now, because of this time that has passed, we can look at them with a much more political lens and revisiting a lot of the assumptions, um, uh, the way that knowledge that was taken as given can be revisited. And I think it's a highly original source compared to a lot of other collections because it sort of tends, tends to be documents that tend to be undervalued, although they're quite rich in the way that you can understand the different um, uh, paradigm and changes and dynamics and so on. So I think it's the, the value of it is revisiting and putting a political lens to some of these documents that seem to be a, a political in some ways. That's what I would like to insist on. Mm. No, that's that's great. And just just to add, because the sort of whole environmental area and environmental history is something that I've also thought quite hard about. I think what we can also see in a case like desertification is how um, ideas that were circulating in the 1930s amongst the French kind of became added to and then sedimented through these various national discussions, as we saw, these regional discussions, these global discussions, and kind of acquired power in such a way that um, the, the, the counter interjections like Colonel Moussa Traore from Mali don't get much traction. They're there, we can see them, but then the debate moves on in its 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 next incarnation um, and power reasserts. So I think if there is a a, a generic lesson, and it's not quite a lesson. I think by looking at these historical genealogies, we can learn something about how power and discourse and the sedimentation of discourses over time works and comes to be so powerful. And actually, frankly, so difficult to challenge so that we do end up with projects um, in this year when the global community is planning to plant great big walls of trees across the Sahel to address an imagined linear advance of the desert um, in very much the same way as that Aubreville was talking about planting a curtain of reserves in 1933. And in between all of that are the everyday ways that people have been living with those landscapes, non-linear dynamics of weather, of vegetation, of climate, um, all of which are kind of pushed away. So I, I think that's, I mean, for me, my big lesson from working with history. Um, so we've got a bit more time. Does anyone else want to, to come in? I'm wondering if any of the team, um, Caroline or Danny or, or Fiona or others who've been involved as a, sort of on the library side of bringing this project to light, want to share anything? I mean, what have been some of your aha moments, some of the excitements in, in doing this, as well as perhaps some of the challenges? Yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, my name is Danny, um, and I'm one of the project officers working on the BLDS project, which has almost come to its conclusion now. So you've heard uh, from academics here about some of the highlights of the collection and the areas of which uh, it's going to be particularly valuable for research. And I guess I just wanted to stress that we've been working on this collection now for three years, uh, so cataloguing it, preserving it, and now promoting it. And what we're really keen is for people to come and start using it now. Uh, I know some students obviously had to get off as well um, before, but we're, it's good to see students and academics here and we're super keen for you to get down in the basement, not literally, but uh, <laughs> uh, but figuratively, and be using these materials 
Um, it's basically a world historic collection. I can't kind of overestimate that, but we know from having worked with it for these years, and it's underneath our feet here. So if you're doing either you're engaged in research or you're going to be doing a dissertation or even writing an essay, then this material is right here, and you will be the first people using it in the way that you'll be like uh, in, in many cases. That some of it is just rare, some of it is absolutely unique. Um, and it's all available to you. You can uh, find it all in the library catalogue now. You can make a request through that catalogue to see it. We have a dedicated space in the library for you to use it. Um, previously, the contact details, I think, were up on the PowerPoint there, but you can find our details uh, and get in touch with us with any questions. But that's the main takeaway that we have from this session, that the material is here, it's great, and it needs to be used, and we're here to help you with any, any issues that you have with that. So thank you. Very good. Very good. Yeah. So I think if there's not more um, to discuss right now, I'm going to thank all of our panelists, thank all of the team again, um, ask you to tell your tell your friends about this seminar, which is going to be on our YouTube channel. Um, take a look at the BLDS project pages, which exist both on the IDS website and in the library. And over the next couple of months, we'll be aligning those communications a bit better and adding some sort of easy how-to guides as to, to, to who, how to get access. And finally, take a look at the exhibition, um, which showcases some of the gems from the collection, some of them you've heard about in this event, um, others you haven't, and they're in the exhibition space downstairs, um, and they'll be there for the next few months. So do take a look, do spread the word, and um, do enjoy and find interesting this research into how understanding the pasts of what we do can help us reflect on the present and even the future. Thanks very, very much. Thank you.